course, that was the easy one. It became a lot more complicated thereafter when what NASA was really aiming for, the uh, Saturn Apollo missions to the moon, became incredibly complicated. And every one was sort of an experimental test flight because no one knew quite was going, what was going to happen, and new things tended to happen on every one of these missions. Um, one of my favorites, but there are lots of these kind of stories, is Apollo 12, which launched during a thunderstorm. Uh, and it was assumed that wouldn't be a problem. Um, airliners fly through thunderstorms constantly. But in this particular case, what happened was 32 seconds after liftoff, lightning struck the craft as it was ascending to orbit. And it rode the contrail of uh, the ionized exhaust jet and glide right back down to the gantry. Hence this photograph. Now, no one in mission control knew what had happened. No one on board the spacecraft knew what had happened. They just knew everything suddenly blacked out. The five F-1 engines are pushing them faster and faster towards orbit, and they're sitting in darkness, lit up only by their emergency flashing lights, wondering what to do next. The commander of the mission, um, Pete Conrad, had his hand tightly gripped on the abort handle, and really, uh, mission protocol said he should have twisted. He should have blown them free of the spacecraft and brought them back down, which would have obviously ended the mission, and uh, that particular crew would not have made it to the moon. He didn't. They kept on riding this thing as they were talking frantically with mission control, trying to figure out what had gone wrong and what could be done. No one knew. But mission control, I'm sure you all know this already, so this is going to seem like review, but mission control was, in essence, this um, highly efficient engineering orchestra that Christopher Kraft and the space cast crew had put together to control these kind of flights. It came out of test flight. Kraft was a controller of uh, initial test flights, Kraft and Gene Kranz, his deputy. Um, but they were working primarily with systems wherein a plane would go more or less straight up and stay in space over the, or stay in the sky over the uh, test flight area, over the, the, the airport, basically, and come back down. Now they were dealing with orbital missions and phenomenal speeds dealing with taking craft to the moon. So what they did is they brought in engineers from industry, the suppliers of the various components, as well as NASA engineers, and built this phenomenal control mechanism. And these are basically the, the, the heads of the Hydra. Behind each one of these controllers uh, in the back rooms were another 20 or 30 guys for each uh, on the loop helping them out. And it was one of those guys who had a suggestion to make, um, suggested basically flipping the system to auxiliary and back. SEC to Ox was the actual command, which very few people in mission control really understood either. In essence, they were rebooting the computer. The command was sent up. One of the three astronauts actually understood it and gave it a try, and everything lit up again, and they were on their way to the moon. With really only one concern, um, <laughs> which wasn't expressed in the spacecraft, it was expressed on the ground. What if the lightning strike had taken out the charges which would fire the parachutes 10 days later at the end of the mission? They thought about that for a while. Should they end the mission here? Should they bring them back down? Do we have any way of testing? Well, there's really no way of knowing whether or not the chute charges were destroyed or not. And after a little more analysis, they realized that, you know what? If the charges don't work, if the chutes don't fire, they're going to be dead in half an hour or 10 days. They might as well go to the moon, which is what they did. They came back 10 days later, and it all worked out very well. Um, Mission control went through a lot of these little exercises, and of course, you know the story of Apollo 13, which we'll actually get to a little bit in a moment, and the various other calamities they ran into. It was a great opportunity to run really bad ideas around in a relatively safe loop and eliminate them. One of my favorite stories is from the very early days of um, tests when they were testing the uh, Redstone uh, uh, missile which was developed by Werner von Braun based on a B-2, and it was what was going to carry Shepard and then Grissom into space. The redstone that they tested, and the astronauts and the press were all standing around watching this, didn't quite work properly. They counted down, they got to zero, and instead of the uh, redstone lifting off, the launch escape tower, the very top of the rocket, which is supposed to carry the capsule away, suddenly fired, and carried the top of the capsule off. And then the parachutes came popping out, and the die markers came out, and kind of straddled down around the rocket. It looked ridiculous and was ridiculous. It was called the popped cork incident. Um, the press made great hay of this. The astronauts were made a little bit more nervous. And everybody in mission control was now sitting, watching on the camera, this fully charged and pressurized rocket sitting on the pad, not sure what to do about it. They didn't want to send anybody out there to deal with it. Smart. 
So they wondered what they could do. They ran various possibilities through, and someone got on the loop and said, well, why don't we get ourselves a high-powered rifle and go punch some holes in that darn thing and release the pressure? And that was when Chris Kraft got on the loop and said, okay, fellows, I think it's time where we have our first rule of mission control, which is if you don't know what to do, don't do anything. And I've since thought that was a pretty good rule for life. So if you take nothing away today, Back to mission critical parts, though. Um, this is the liquid oxygen tank uh, fan switch from the Apollo configuration. This is the thing that went wrong on Apollo 13. It was a power incompatibility between the manufacturer of the LOX tank and the CAPE, which initially had been on a 28 volt system and then actually switched to a 62 volt system. Um, and the memo didn't get around. So the switch was still meant to operate on a 28 volt system and um, in an early test of this particular tank they were trying to um, depressurize it quickly so everyone could go to dinner. And they came up with a great trick for doing that which was just to turn the heater fan on and basically burn off the gas within and let it vaporize. But at the temperatures that the thing cooked up to because it was firing at three times the voltage it should have, the Teflon insulation melted and created a scenario where the next time you turn this thing on, there was a very good chance it could spark. This is the tank that flew on Apollo 13. But the same tests have been run, and the same problems existed on Apollo 10, 11, and 12. Had the cryo tank stir that Sidey ever got asked for uh, occurred on any of those missions, and at the point in the mission where it would have been a problem with the locks down to a certain level, the accident would have occurred on, on, uh, on those flights. As it happened, it didn't. But it did result in a real understanding of the concept of mission critical. Any factor, personnel, equipment, or procedure being essential for crew survival and or successful completion of the mission. Which brings us back to where we started earlier, that Fisher $10 million zero-g space pen. Um, $10 million back when that actually meant something. Here it is in use. Here's Neil Armstrong actually on board the LEM using the darn thing. Um, very effective. But obviously there were those in Congress who were not crazy about this at all. Um, here's one of them right here. This is a fellow named William Proxmire. He's no longer with us, but you may have heard of him. Um, he was not a big fan of the space program or very many other scientific uh, works at that time. Oh, he looks too sweet here. This is him at the end of his career. Let's, let's see if we can get him what he looked like back in the 60s. Um, there he is. Right, back when he looked like the father from that 70s show. Much better. Um, <laughs> Proxmire came up with what he called the Golden Fleece Awards, which was something he would hand out every month or so in the Senate to whatever government organization had, in his opinion, fleeced Congress. And a perennial, the only one he kept doing again and again and again, was that stupid space pen, which he just loathed. What's wrong with a number two pencil, he used to say. That's what the commies are using, which was true. That is exactly what the Russians were using. Um, there were, as it turns out, by the way, problems with that number pencil among them, the graphite had a tendency to flake off and get into stuff and also cause problems, but that wasn't what Proxmire wanted to hear. But here's what happened on Apollo 11. When their one and only foray out on the lunar surface ended and they climbed back aboard the LEM, one of the last things they had to do for the sake of weight was discard anything that they no longer needed, including their external suits and their backpacks, which were tossed out the hatch back onto the lunar surface. Armstrong when he tossed out his backpack, hit the toggle switch that fired the ascent engine and knocked it flush with the panel, broke it off. And suddenly, there was no way to fire the ascent engine on the limb. What was he going to do? And then he remembered that space pit, which, as it worked out, fit perfectly into the hole. And Neil Armstrong thus became the first, and so far as I know, the only guy in history to hotwire a vehicle on another planet. Um, now, it's probably also worth pointing out that had Proxmire succeeded in his goal and stopped these guys, to stop the space band from flying, Neil and Buzz might still be on the moon, um, frozen in an eternal salute, presumably to send.